Uh, welcome to our to one of the last talks talks here. Uh, there are Linux. Um, <coughs> we're going to talk about honeypots. Um, should we start with inter introduction? Uh, maybe a little bit of motivation first. So I don't know. Maybe some show of hands. Uh, uh, let's start with raise your hand, everyone. Uh, put your hand down if you uh, have never heard about security. That's good. If you have never heard about security, uh, put your hand down if you are uh, not working in security. Okay, put your hand down if you're not using honeypots. Okay. Um, so the, the reason why we, we are here is um, we want to kind of tell you a little bit what honeypots are, um, why you would use them. Um, how they, why they're useful, and what you get out of it. That's kind of the high level um, reason why we are here and why we're talking. Um, we will start with a short introduction. My name is Lukas Rist. Um, I'm from Norway. I'm born in Germany, but I, I live in Norway since a couple of years. I'm a system engineer for, uh, used to be a Norwegian company, then we became Blue Coat. Um, you might have heard of it. There's an enterprise security company doing network optimization, filtering, um, and then recently got bought by Symantec. Um, you might have heard of it. It's a slightly bigger company doing security. And I'm working on um, sandboxing. So we do a lot of uh, behavioral analysis of malware in, in uh, Norway. In my free time, I'm working on Honeypot since about 2009. I started as a student back then, um, worked my way up um, by contributing a lot, um, building different honeypots, um, doing some research. And at the moment, I'm the chief research officer for the HoneyNet project, um, helping driving their vision in, when it comes to research, driving collaborations, and uh, how we share data with other people. Yeah, and then there's me. My name is Daniel. I'm from Austria and working at the University of Applied Sciences in Simperton. And I work there as a IT security researcher and a part-time lecturer, so uh, it's probably like uh, 30, 70 in terms of research and, and doing the lecturing stuff uh, and running the network labs there, trying to keep them secure and, and, and running as far as I'm able to do that with having like 200 of IT security students trying to fuck your systems up every day because they want to try or just can, yeah. And I started doing honeypots a few years ago during uh, a security-related project for, a, let's say, a larger company that, that um, creates hardware in the ICS and SCADA business and uh, doesn't want to be mentioned nowhere when it comes to security. And, uh, when I did this, I came to a project called Compot and started to contribute there, uh, being forced to do it because Lucas uh, refused to apply changes, changes I needed for my project and, and driven me to contribute instead of just telling them what to do, which was quite annoying. And now I'm a member at, or contributor at the HanaNet project uh, too. The two of us are in the Norwegian chapter, which is quite nice. We are an, um, a guy from Denmark, a guy from Germany, and a guy from Austria working at the Norwegian chapter doing stuff. It proves to be like some sort of neutral ground, I guess. Yeah, and then there's a third guy who's not there today. Uh, I want to apologize for him not showing up. Um, his name is Johnny. We he contributes to, we don't know what he's actually doing because he won't tell us. And well, I guess that's the story. We're not supposed to ask questions. Yeah. Okay. So the HoneyNet project is a non-profit organization uh, registered in the US. <coughs> it was founded in 2001. <coughs> um, you might have seen some Black Hawk talk, uh, Black Hat talks from uh, HoneyNet project in 2002 or three maybe. Uh, when they first um, announced the results from setting up a computer back then, running an operating system, being directly connected to the internet with some network monitoring on it. 
that was more or less the, the first high interaction honeypot they have set up. Um, this got quite some interest also from some three letter organizations in the uh, US agencies um, who started funding the project. Um, the project quickly expanded um, through various corporations with universities and more countries and more people joined the project. And when we got members from countries with not so good relationships to the US, um, the original funding kind of went away. They, they put us on, the, we had to choose between kicking out, kicking out members from Iran, Pakistan, for example, or keeping the funding. And we decided to get rid of the funding and, and invite those people in to the organization. Uh, nowadays, we have about 55 chapters in 40 countries. Um, we are more than 400 researchers. Um, this sounds like a lot of people, but um, <clears throat> what happens usually is that we get new people into the organization, usually students um, joining it and trying to get some data or trying to do some research, trying to build some tools. At the same time, um, the old people who are in the project for a very long time, they got a day job, they got family, and they don't have the time to, to work on projects in their free time. So they kind of become alumni st status members. Um, they still contribute, they ask, they answer questions if there's some young student who needs some information or some experience, but they're more or less dormant until we need them. So I would say the, the hard core of, of uh, working people who are, who are active is between 80 and 120. And all the code we produce, everything is open source. Um, there's a couple of data sets that we provide, but it's, uh, yeah. Most of the things we do is in the open. Um, so I wanted to start with a couple of concepts, so kind of to make a, a base level, so we, we, we kind of are on the same ground when we talk about honeypots. Um, I use this analogy of, of an onion when I, when I introduce security, or concepts of security, and when I kind of try to place honeypots in this security concept. Onions, because um, if you've ever cut an onion, you know, you cut into it, you start crying. And the reason is there's multiple layers in an onion. You can see it on the picture. And every layer contains small bubbles with um, some liquids in it. And when the bubbles burst, they, they create some, some fumes and gases and they react with your eyes and you start crying. And whenever you cut through those layers, like more of those bubbles burst. And this is basically also a little bit how you should um, architect your security posture. So it's not one layer and if someone breaches the layer, they're inside and you're fucked. But it should be multiple layers, and there should be multiple different ways to detect things. So whenever someone cuts into it, first he needs to cry, it needs to be difficult. But at the same time, if he cuts through one layer, um, there should be another layer that, that protects the more critical things. So compartmentalize your infrastructure and make sure that um, it is painful and difficult to get inside. Um, <clears throat> next step, going further towards honeypots. Um, when you build a security um, architecture, when you protect your, your environment, you need to know what you're protecting against. Um, if you only protect against attacks against your, I don't know, SSH server or FTP server, maybe you're missing all the attacks on port 80 or whatever port that is currently interesting for Attica. So if you don't know what you're protecting against, you might invest a lot of money in the wrong systems, in, in the wrong technology that protects you against attacks against that certain um, exposure that you have, but it might leave other um, pieces of, open that you need to protect against. So the more knowledge you have, the more effective you can build up secu your security posture. Um, I, I, this is a, a slide that I'm using later again to um, de describe how, it, how you should deploy your honeypot, but just briefly how security risk could be defined. Um, so it's the likelihood of a successful attack. So how likely is it that someone is going to break and into your system and is successful breaking into it, and the consequences. Um, you can always like, go to the extremes of those um, um, components of the security risk. So if the consequences are zero, then the security risk is also zero. Now, usually, someone breaking into your system, consequences are never zero, but if you go to extremes. So if you look at the likelihood of a successful attack, if you split this up, um, it's usually com um, composed out of the threat. So if there's no threat, then the likelihood is very little. If you have no vulnerabilities, which is unlikely, but if, if this is a true statement, if you have zero vulnerabilities, then the success part of the likelihood of a successful attack is zero. And if you're not attractive as a target, then it's unlikely that you have, that there will be a successful attack. We're coming back to this when we talk about honeypots. 
So now we want to compare honeypot technology. That's the first uh, row with other more traditional technologies. Um, what, what should stand out in, in this slide is that honeypots are, uh, gives you information, gives you data that it allows you to react to attacks because you can understand an attack. For example, if you compare with a firewall, firewall allows you pretty much no reaction because all the firewall is doing, it's blocking an attack. It's blocking a connection. And if, so, if someone connects to your system, it's blocked, that's good. I mean, hands down, that's, that's how it's supposed to work. But you're not, you don't understand what he's trying to do. Is he trying to get inside to steal something? Is he trying to get inside to buy some shoes? So what is the reason? Why is, what is his motive? What's the technology? What's the techniques that he's using to get inside? So the reaction component is very little because the, in, all the information you have is maybe an IP address, a source port, destination port, maybe a payload if there's something in there, but who knows? Um, the same goes for IDS and IPS. They are much more better detection because they actually look at the traffic, they look at the data. Um, if you have ever written rules for Snort, Suricata, then you know they're actually looking at the payload. They're not just blocking um, connections. Antivirus is kind of in between. Antivirus these days is not just antivirus, not just signature applied to binaries. It's usually a framework of firewalls, Jewish detection preventions, all kind of those, those technologies combined in a, in a bundle. Um, the bottom one, actually, security standards, is, is not a technology, it's, it's a practice. Um, and this is basically the the counterpart to reaction. So if, if you have good security standards, um, the, the probability of attacks, things like phishing, is unlikelier. It's not impossible, but it, it's more difficult. So this is just putting honeypot in a kind of perspective to other technologies and strategies. You want to take over? No, that's yours. OK. <laughs> This is a, our, one of our most favorite quotes from, from a famous Chinese, Chinese dude who does a lot of war-related quotes. Um, Thus, the expert in battle moves the enemy and is not moved by him. And this is kind of what we, why, why we enjoy building honeypots. Because instead of just sitting there and let them destroy your system or break into your system, it's more like, okay, come inside. <coughs> let's, let's have a walk together. And then you just start walking them around. And you start messing with them. You start slowing the traffic down, you, you randomly disconnect connections and they go, what the hell, again, what's up with this network? So you, you keep more control over an attack. It is not that you go out and punch them in the face. It's not proactive or active defense. It's more like, yeah, you you're kind of you got inside, but you're not really inside and I, I can still mess with you. I can waste your time. I, I can make it expensive for you to break into my system. And this is the fun part about honeypots. Um, but on the other side, you should never use honeypot as a replacement for things like intrusion detection, prevention, antivirus. It's not a replacement. It extends your security posture. And um, we had multiple cases where people thought they're on a real system and they're on a honeypot, so they, they tricked themselves or I was trying to do something on my machine and for some reason it wasn't working, but I was actually in my honeypot. So, um, don't get fooled by honeypots. They're not that like the silver bullet against cybercrime or ransomware or whatever it's currently trending. It is something that is it's on one side fun, but it's also a very good tool to uh, get information and intelligence about your opponents. So what, what do we want to achieve with honeypots? Actually, uh, one of the things we want to have is uh, the element of surprise, some, some sort of deception, okay? So we want to decoy a system and tell the attacker that this is, this is the right stuff and he's messing with something very important here, or uh, at least we want to have those bots spending time on our systems. So the first thing is uh, we try to hide the real stuff, the good stuff from the attacker by placing some low-hanging fruits uh, in front of the good stuff. The second thing is, uh, let's, let's, let's say recon because I, I, I would never get the word straight out of my mouth. Um, which, which uh, should give you a better overview uh, over what actually is going on out there. Yeah? So we want to have information on what attacks uh, are currently on the networks or especially on your network. Um, is, for example, your IDS or IPS uh, properly configured? Because if uh, your honeypot, uh, your honey system tells you that something happened but your IDS or IPS does not, there's probably something uh, going wrong and 
you see stuff before shit hits the fan, usually. Yeah. Um, you can increase the cost for the adversary, which means that uh, he has to spend much more time in trying to get into your system because he will spend time on systems that are, are actually worthless to you. But you, on the other hand, gain data that will help you uh, during your daily work of securing and uh, getting intel on what is actually going on there. And you stay in control. So that's what Lucas said before. Uh, you're somehow being proactive in that manner that you are the one who controls the adversary and not the other way around. So you're not chasing a guy around in your network, but you know where he is, what he's doing. You can look over his shoulder and you can see, ah, he's trying this and that or whatever. The real nice thing about this is uh, you won't only catch things that are known to, uh, like for example, IDS or IPS systems, but you also see things like zero-day zero exploits. You see things that happen for the first time because they hit you before they even known to other guys. Yeah? And there are countless types of honeypots. So uh, don't mistake honeypots for being pure simple systems like computers. Uh, Trend Micro, I guess, yeah, Trend Micro uh, set up a phone pot recently and uh, did a paper on that, uh, which is a quite nice way of uh, getting information on how many unsolicited spam calls you get uh, when you lose your number on the street or you uh, use a telephone number and type them into various applications you get for free on the App Store, for example. So uh, they tried that. They tried to take like hundreds of applications and put their telephone number in t inside them and then watched for uh, cellular messages and uh, calls from guys that want to sell you something or that want to trick you to like answer somebody or call back or whatever. So there are even things like mobile phone honeypots, for example. Or maybe look at you. Um, we announced this, this talk with like uh, interactive pew pew maps and uh, having uh, rock music, I guess. Um, you won't see anything of that here. It's just well, you're here, so uh, you're not wasting the time of other guys in other rooms, so maybe that's, that, that's too some sort of honeypot if you want to, okay? Um, this is a real-world example I, I noticed a few weeks ago. I'm not sure some of you might have noticed uh, the news uh, about the remove password um, commit message thing. I, I'm not sure if, if all of you got that. Um, there was the case that if you, somebody noticed that if you enter remove password uh, on GitHub, then you get like all the commit messages with the word remove password in there. Yeah? And turns out that most of them were just like, ah, I, I accidentally uh, hard coded my user credentials root password and uh, my IP address into this source stuff and pushed it to GitHub. That's a very bad idea. I have to get rid of that. So what did they do? They removed that, then they added a commit message. Very, very briefly, they, they told everybody that they removed the password uh, at this stage, and then you just look the commit messages up, uh, hit the diff button, and you see uh, what they were trying to hide. And um, you can see it's like 300,000 hits. On yeah, the it's, it's, it's obviously not all of them are the real thing, of course, but yeah. And when I, when I, uh, got notice of that, uh, I, I, I went to GitHub and had a look for myself and, and, and the first three pages were like full of root credentials and at this point I, I was feeling like in a traffic accident. I know you're not supposed to look at it, but you have to somehow. So I uh, tried to log in with some of those servers just out of curiosity if they are really working. <laughs> Turns out all of them were working but they were strange, okay? So really strange. They, they didn't behave like a server should behave. Files were missing, applications were missing. Most of the stuff was really obviously broken. It's like your cursor is here and you hit return and uh, at, at, the, at the next line, the cursor was here. Very bad implementations and I, I was really not sure what was going on there. And after I logged in, I noticed that Something was wrong and I thought, okay, let fuck the system, uh, go to the next one and I entered exit and I dropped back into a prompt that wasn't mine. So 
when you lose a machine and you're not on your machine again, some, something's smelly, okay? And um, it took a while for me to figure out that uh, it was actually a whole bunch of collection of Kippo honeypots, which are uh, designated SSH honeypots, low interaction SSH honeypots. Low interaction in this case means uh, I was easily able to, to see that this is not the real thing, uh, but it took me like almost a few minutes to, 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 to get that straight. And it has things like a fake, a fake file system. So if I would have made a curl or a wget to load some payload and, and get further into the system, it would have stored that for later analysis. So uh, you can edit faster, you can view faster, download them. It's pretty neat, yeah? And it, of course, it logs all the things because it's supposed to do. So somebody was really interested in what are the guys, the, the assholes like me in this case, I'm sorry for that, um, doing to a system when they find root credentials on GitHub commit messages. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure I, I tapped into that. And after the fourth or the fifth uh, Kippo SSH honeypot, I, I just quit doing this research because I thought like, I, I don't have the time for that. So the, the strategy worked out in my case because I was, I was torn away from looking at the maybe real systems there. And the thing is, the disconnect doesn't disconnect because the, the maintainers of Kippo are interested in what are you actually doing after you think you have closed the connection to the system, okay? So are you looking for special files that only exist on your computer? Are you typing like, uh, trying to send a mail or something? That's, that's pretty neat, I guess. That's a really, a really neat thing, like, thing to do. So for the concepts, what, what are honeypots, what, what types of honeypots do we have? Uh, we mentioned Kippo, which is a lower interaction honeypot. Uh, low interaction means uh, they usually do almost next to nothing, okay? You can scan with Nmap and you see, ah, the port's open, and if you have something like a deeper scanner that goes on layer seven, layer seven, you see that it's actually exchanging banners. In best case, you have limited interaction capabilities, so you can tell it something to do and it will do, but it's not a real system. It's just, it's not even emulated, and most of the time it's simulated, okay? So uh, it's just collecting things and mostly, uh, most of the time it's collecting things from um, bots, for example, or script kiddies. Um, they're really easy to deploy. You just need virtually no amount of uh, uh, performance or, or hardware or whatever. They are easy to distribute but they are really easy to reveal. So um, they will keep an attacker uh, interested for like seconds if, if worst comes to the worst. They just give you a glimpse at the global picture so you can see what is actually happening but you don't see more than that. And then there are high interaction, high interaction honeypots. These are real systems with tight monitoring, okay? So you have like a um, SCADA system there, like a Siemens Symmetic S7 400, whatever, and uh, you want to see what are attacks doing to it, so you put it like behind a proxy or uh, do some debug, uh, uh, solder some debug outputs and take this thing and uh, get it onto the internet and look at it and watch it burn, usually. Um, thing is that uh, this can be to, to some extent dangerous because you never know what's happening to this thing because most of the time you don't know all the security holes in these products. So you should do this on a separate network, of course. They're really difficult to detect because while being a honeypot, they are at the same time the real thing, but usually not in production, okay? And uh, you're really able to collect real information that helps you in uh, finding security holes and uh, applying countermeasures. But they are really expensive. They are complicated to set up and you need all the stuff and the real things. and. Uh, setup and maintaining means that you have to watch log files. You have to uh, look at everything that is going on there, and that can be a tedious and complicated task. There's a couple of, co of companies out there that take their product, whatever they build and sell to the customers, and put it on the public internet and then wait until the system gets compromised or they see how people try to break it. So they use the, the idea of honeypots to, to do testing on their, uh, on their products, get free tests. That's cheap beta testing, actually before it gets to the customer where the cheaper beta testing happens then. Okay, um, the third concept we have are some sort of lures. Uh, lures means that um, 
setting up a honeypot is one thing, but getting the thing uh, out to the public and, and, and just uh, getting uh, attackers to attack it actually uh, is another thing. So like for the mobile phone thing, here in Austria, for example, if you want to have a mobile honeypot, you just ask your, your provider to put your telephone number onto the phone book and you're pretty much uh, honeypot from then on because you get lots of messages and lots of uh, calls from some dubious telephony companies that want to sell you something or ask you something, uh, at least from, from, from my uh, perspective. Per perspective. Um, for honeypots uh, on the internet, uh, you do it like this. You have, for example, a telnet server, which should uh, be your, uh, your honeypot. And then you have, on the other side, a client that connects to this server over the internet. And that's a client controlled by you, and he does that like uh, every few hours, and he logs in with username and password, which are then uh, described as honey tokens. And then you do this like for weeks, and you wait for other guys who do the same. So as soon as some other guy logs in using the same user and password uh, combination like you did on your lure system on your bait system, you know something's wrong there. Somebody's listening at your packet. Somebody is, uh, has some sort of access to your connection and knows that you are actually communicating to this and that system. So you might find things like uh, adversaries on your network, adversaries because you have a system that's infected and somehow logging data, etc. So there are really nice insights using honey tokens. Okay, we want to go a little bit over to the uh, security of things or industrial security or Internet of Things um, to then go over to our honeypot um, that we have built together. Um, so I will go briefly into industrial security just to give a highlight what it means if you're, you, if you're supposed to protect an industrial system because there's quite some, some different mindsets out there when it comes to it. Uh, so this is just a story that um, came up a couple of years ago. There was a gun gunman shooting uh, a power substation. Power substation are those small nodes all over the country that um, make sure that power is going from grid segments to grid segments. So um, this guy was, he was ignoring the air gap, or he was just jumping the air gap easily with his gun, um, shooting the power station for whatever reason, uh, which took down the power station. So physical security is a big problem. I mean, even if you air gapped, if you have a fence around your, your industrial system, it's not enough to stop someone to break into. Or it's shoot at it. Or shoot at it, yeah. <laughs> for whatever reason, to take it down. And that's, that's a big impact on a, on a power system, on a power grid, depending on how good they are with uh, redundancy. But um, if you take down multiple substations, um, then parts of the grid will go down. Um, so now going over to smart factories, um, or in Germany we have Industry 4.0, which is the, the buzzword around making all those facilities more smarter, which, which means you have full tracking of materials going into it, um, products going out to it, out of it you have interconnecting of, of facilities to make sure that you're not overproducing or underproducing certain resources. Um, but actually what, what's happening is they're not um, using new technology. What they use, they use proven technology that we have built and used for 10, 20 years and applying it to very old things. So this is industrial, IoT uh, in, in, in a nutshell. So what, what has to happen from, from, from their point of view is the, the people who are running those systems, they have to adapt to, okay, my system is now connected to the internet. People from the outside will try to break into it. This is the, a new thing that's going to, to hit them and um, what they have to adapt to. I have a couple of quotes um, from this field. Uh, no, you can't make a vulnerability scan. What if that triggers a firmware update and the robot breaks? And this is actually, this is, this is a true statement. I mean, this can actually happen. I mean, you can break something by doing a vulnerability scan because vulnerability scan is just pushing out the buttons in random order and opening out the drawers. That's a vulnerability scan. And that, in a system that's only supposed to do one thing and nothing else, that only speaks one language and not everything that we throw at it, this can break the system. So this is something they have to be concerned about. They have to make sure that the system keeps running because if it stops running, this is really expensive. You, you have to be really, really thoughtful on, on security scans uh, either way. Uh, we had the thing that a student 
in, in, in the course of a project, uh, tried to do a security scan for a customer, um, and he tried to uh, have a security scan on their web shop, which was actually a nice idea. So, you, you know, these crawlers, they just push every button, hit every link and everything. So, uh, when he thought uh, it might be a good idea to check their backend, and uh, entered those backend access credentials to the crawler. The crawler just hit every delete button he found in order to like purge the web shop uh, in like four or five seconds. Everything was gone, no backup for, for, of course, because you're not, most of the time, you're not testing the dev system, you're testing the only system that's there and that's in production. So you, you have to be thoughtful anyway. And uh, I'm pretty sure there are ICS connect, or I even know some ICS devices that have web interfaces and when you hit the update firmware button, uh, you can break things if you send something on port 80 afterwards without knowing what you're doing there. No, we can't do network security monitoring, antivirus patching, vulnerability scanning, or any other kind of security measures because the system is critical. And this is how they work. I mean, for us, critical means we have to protect it. We have to set up firewalls. We have to secure it. But for them means don't touch it because as soon as you start touching it, things might break. And this is all legitimate. I, I do understand those people. If they say, don't touch the system because it breaks, I can understand that. That makes sense to a certain degree. I mean, you still should build security around it, but um, it makes sense. And we, yes, I mean, as, as an IT guy in traditional IT, we go, okay, I have to run AV on the system. Otherwise, you're going to be screwed. There will be ransomware on it in less than five minutes these days. Um, this was a, a response to, there was a, a couple of um, water utility facilities which got um, hacked into. And the facility, um, so the, the, the other side that got hacked, uh, made a statement. And their statement was, most public utilities rely on highly customized SCADA systems. So SCADA systems are those um, controlling system, very simple systems, but they do open valves, open, let the water run, stop the water. Um, so they're very customized for those specific use cases. No two are the same, so hacking them requires specific knowledge. Um, yeah, they do require specific knowledge, but if I can just run Nessus and map against them and they break, that's like still bad. So yes, they, they use customized protocols. They're usually proprietary. You have to read a big book to understand them, but you can easily break them without any knowledge. That, that was like in 2002. We have now 2017, and the only thing that changed is that now they say you, you don't do that. Okay, don't uh, scan our networks. That's their security measure. They didn't apply security, they just tell you you're not allowed to do that. So this is a bit polemic, but I'm, I'm still putting it out there. So some of the problems they're struggling with is there, there, there's some arrogance in the, out there. They will say, um, this is a system that runs, so therefore it's fine. Um, there's blind certainty when it comes to its air gap. How should they ever come in there? And if you ever try to get into an air gap system, there's many ways. There's side channel attacks. You can put a video camera to, to look at screens. You can break physically into it. You drop a USB stick on a parking lot. There's many ways to get into an air gap system. And then the next problem that kind of is also caused for the first problem is lack of education and professionalism. So they don't, they, there's no uh, computer, uh, degree in industrial security. There are now courses popping up where you can get trained in industrial security, but there's, there's little connection between the security world and the industrial world. And that's slowly changing. So now coming back to, to honeypots, if they would know what's out there, what's going to hit them, what's, what the problems are, they would understand better how to protect themselves. And this is where we came in and we started building our own industrial honeypot. Um, this is just... Side note, some, some of the buzzwords you will hear is um, whenever you buy a product from a vendor, they will say, okay, this is not the perfect product, but we will try our best to protect you, but you have to still uh, make sure that if you get pre um, breached that you are able to recover, that the damage is as low as possible. The same applies to industrial security products, but breaking into an industrial system, breaking into a, a nuclear reactor has much more implications than breaking into a company and stealing a couple of PDF files. Um, so let's go with Conpot. So Conpot was a system that um, kind of was born out of a presentation by Trent Micro. 
Um, they have a couple of guys that do honey potting, um, but most of it is um, towards paper, so they don't release their tools, unfortunately. Um, so this was a blackout talk. Uh, who's really attacking your ICS equipment? They put out a couple of ICS-related sensors, start collecting data, make the, made a presentation, and I contacted them and said, hey, this is really cool stuff, and we, as the HoneyNet project, would like to also deploy this kind of sensors. Can you share your code? They said, unfortunately not. Um, this is all internally developed, and they don't want to give their competitors an edge, so it's, yeah, we cannot give you the code. But so we started to build our own ICS honeypot, and actually it took us some 10 lines of Python code to build an ICS honeypot. And we made the ICS honeypot open source on day one. Um, what we basically did, we opened a port that was uh, known for ICS protocols. We, news, we used a Modbus uh, Python library, so the, 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 um, whenever it's someone connected to the open port, he was able to communicate using the Modbus protocol, which is a very common uh, industrial protocol, um, communicate with our honeypot. There we go, we could see people connecting to it and speaking the language that we expected. Everything is on mushmush.org. The data is, uh, we, we do collect some data, but it's really difficult for us to share it. Um, so setting up the honeypot is trivial. Okay. Um, so honeypot uh, is uh, a honeypot like compot is uh, designed to run like everywhere and you can also use it at home if you want so but the first thing that the most people notice is why should I start an ICS or SCADA related honeypot at home because uh, any adversary would tell uh, would would easily see okay that's a home network um, who is running like a nuclear power site in his cellar uh, that's that's pretty much obvious that this is not the case but um, ICS is much, is much more than this uh, in terms of uh, IoT uh, today. If you have something like a Hue bridge, if you have something like smart meters, which are apparently here uh, already, then uh, these are, in, 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 to some extent, ICS-related protocols uh, that you could emulate and you could see who is going to get in touch with your systems. Um, there are two deployment strategies for them. Uh, we, we usually use something like VIC deployments, which means uh, if you are, for example, a company and you want to have multiple honeypots and see what's going on on your company sites in, for example, Europe or, uh, or all over the world, then uh, you can, for example, use VIC deployments by Pre, uh, preparing systems, installing the honeypot on them, uh, shipping them somewhere, and, and you're ready to go. Or you can use thin deployments. The, the difference is um, for a global deployment, uh, get ready for shipping and customs and everything, because even if you just take Raspberry Pis, put a honeypot on them, and ship them to 22 countries, uh, you're having a lot of, of work to do. Uh, and it's individual maintenance, because you have to... Um, care of each and every part, you have to collect the data, you have to do log analysis and stuff, so this is, this is, this is pretty tedious. So you usually use something, or you can use something like thin deployments, which means uh, if you want like five honeypots or ten honeypots, you take a virtual machine and install uh, virtual uh, containers on it, for example like uh, an ESXi or a Proxmox, something like that, and then you use Thin redirectors, uh, like uh, honey traffic redirectors, re re redirectors, which is just um, you have virtual machines you bought at uh, various data centers or you have located in your, in your other sites, and they do like IP tables and redirect the stuff to you. And if you apply a nice combination of uh, source and destination nut, uh, you preserve all the data from the headers, you, you preserve the, the sending IP address, you are, of course, the destination. You can route it back. Everything is on one site. You have all the logs on, on one server. You don't have to apply like uh, much uh, hardware and, and, and cost into the thing. And everything is there on one point. The logic stays in your hands. You don't have to ship it somewhere. And logic stays in your hands and you don't have to ship is especially important if you want to do this in countries that are not so friendly for IT security researchers. Um, we tried. Uh, literally tried hard to uh, get uh, honeypots deployed in uh, Pakistan, Iran, uh, something like that. Yeah, um, 
what, what I would not try to do again is using our university's credit card to uh, buy VPS servers in Pakistan and Iran, uh, which uh, drove our uh, dean crazy because uh, we blocked our credit card like countless times and uh, having only one credit card in an institution is not the, the, the nice thing to do. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's still not easy to do something like that without having people there who actually install this thing for you. Um, it is like impossible to get top level domains in some countries. Yeah, I, I tried to get a top level domain in, in Iran and what it required was someone has to, had to physically walk into an office and sign a physical paper and show their ID to get a... It's, it's, it's like applying at NIC at AT with your passport and asking them for a domain here. Um, yeah. Uh, this is another way how to not deploy your honeypots. Um, you might have heard of Shodan. Um, they, they have been in news a couple of times. Shodan is scanning the whole IPv4 space on a couple of ports. Um, they, they grab the, the header, the, the, the banners they get from the different services on the different ports, and then you can search it. It's basically a Google for connected devices. So obviously, you can also search for honeypots on it um, if you know how a honeypot looks like. Um, usually, a honeypot should change all those values. And in this case, we searched for mouse factory because this is our default, very obvious, um, fake factory name. Um, but if you, use, if you don't change the honeypot, if you don't change the default conf configuration, put it on the internet, Shodan will find you, and Shodan actually now um, labels you as a honeypot. Um, back then, we found about 100 honeypots, which were deployed uh, without any change of the default configuration. So, so one, 100 deployments of conpot, actually, which scream, I'm a honeypot, don't use me. Yeah. Why not change the default configuration? And this was actually, uh, I don't know if you, this is a US company, and it ends with corporation, big software things, maybe you know it. Um, so this brings it also to, to the problem of how do you prevent someone of detecting you as a honeypot. Um, the first rule that we define as if you do proper deception is you don't talk about deception. You don't talk about your honeypots. So how is that going to work with the HoneyNet project where everything is open source. So I put my, op my honeypot public on GitHub. People can download it and run it. And then at the same time, I want to prevent people from detecting that I'm a honeypot. So this is a, it's, there's some, some, yeah, things to consider. There are some ways that we can solve some of the problems, but we'll, we will never completely solve it. Uh, most of the time, we basically count on them on the bad guys not caring that much about stepping in a honeypot. But then if you really want to get your APT attack in your honeypot, you probably want to build your own honeypot. Okay. Um, since we almost run out of time, uh, a short overview over what Conpot actually does right now. Yeah? Uh, if, you, if you don't see your favorite ICS or SCADA protocol here, uh, you are very welcome to do a pull request. That was the same case when I started to work for Conpot. Um, we uh, we at, the, um, at the moment, we support HTTP, SNMP, and Modbus, which you usually find on things like SCADA systems, like uh, S7, which is a, a Siemens-related protocol, um, and we support Comstrup, which is a smart meter thing in Denmark, maybe. Nordics, at least. Or, or in, in, in other countries. So Campstrup is, is like a, a, a manufacturer for, for smart meters. And we have something like a proxy module, which means that uh, you're able to take whatever device you want to monitor and uh, route all the traffic through Compot, and it will try its best to decode the protocol and show you, at least shows you what's going on there. Because actually there's a backnet is missing, which is a yeah. facility yeah. automation management something protocol. So if you want to uh, replicate a smart house, you could use the BACnet protocol. It's like um, air conditioning and, and, and stuff is usually BACnet. There yeah. was also some support for a gas station. So there's, if you have a regular gas station, there's a tank um, that has a filling, so you can read out how full the tank is. And there's a pump, you can run or stop the pump. Um, there's a couple of uh, companies that are building very complex honeypots, um, not just a certain protocol, but they built a train track and have trains, model trains running on it, and you can hack into the, the model train, or they built s small smart houses where you can actually physically turn off and on a light um, when you break into the system. Uh, so we wanted to end the, uh, the presentation with something a bit more 
uh, interactive, more fun. Uh, so this is a, a live feed from one of our honeypots. Um, I will first explain what you see before I hit refresh so you can see some live data. But um, so basically this is a honeypot which um, opens every port in quotation marks. Um, so every connection to the honeypot it will go to the uh, NFQ tables, which is uh, a Linux kernel feature where you can take packets from the network layer in the kernel up to user space. You can modify it and send it back into the network layer and then it goes wherever you send it to, which allows us to every incoming packet gets redirected to one server. One, so we have to list on one port. Every packet goes to that port, no matter what the destination, packet, uh, destination port for that packet was. This allows us to find attacks against port where we never expected an attack. So in, in this honeypot, I see stuff like someone trying to print something on a printer. Someone tries to connect to a medical device, like a injection system or whatever they have. So I see a lot of things that I would never have expected to see. It requires some work because I don't support those protocols. I can just, I can record the data, I can, uh, I can store the data and then later look at it. I can use the PCAPs to understand what kind of protocol or devices they targeted. But this is basically a, a big magnifying lens on whatever is um, going out there and is trying to hit me in all kinds of ways. Um, so here, there's just a, a couple of things that we regularly see. So uh, you see the SH, so someone is trying to connect to port uh, 22. Um, then here's the very classical uh, connection to 23, Telnet. Um, this is the number of interactions we had with this um, connection on that specific port. Um, this is a very, not very readable, but this is the interaction which we got on this connection. So this is the regular Telnet. So I'm writing a uh, username. So I, I'm giving him a prompt to log in. He logs in with root. Uh, password is 1234. Um, then we have the regular interaction of uh, Mirai trying to infect my router, camera, DVR system, whatever it is they're trying to infect. Um, so they first try to, to understand on what kind of system are. So they do a couple of commands, try to verify, okay, this is actually a vulnerable system. And <clears throat> further down the line, so when they kind of establish, okay, this is an actual target I'm interested in, they are going to use uh, wget. Uh, to download the binary and then execute the binary on the system. So this is basically their backdoor, uh, which then they use for DDoS attacks. So this is the regular um, array spreading and attacking um, connected devices. Demo gods. So this is actually real, uh, real time sensor feed. So as soon as the next connections uh, hit the honeypot, they will show up here. So I hope this will happen like any, any second now. So because this is live data, we rely on bad guys attacking us while we demo this. So it's sometimes something happens, sometimes they get um, hundreds of attacks in a, in a very short time frame. So that means uh, in average, I think I get one attack per second. Um, but that also means, I mean, I get bursts sometimes of hundreds of um, SH uh, brute force attacks in a very short time frame. So sometimes we just see nothing or maybe the server broke again because I write bad code sometimes. Okay. I think it's the second one. Okay. <laughs> so uh, are there any questions uh, regarding the subject? Or disregarding the subject? <laughs> then thank you very much for, for spending your time with us. We're really glad that you tapped our honeypot at least. And uh, we, would, we would love to, to hear from you if you have like, any questions you don't uh, dare to ask in, in front of others. Uh, if you would help us or contribute, uh, we would be even grateful. Uh, we don't want your money, we want your code, which is more important for us. It's a, it's a fun topic. It's, it's um, something I, I happily do in my free time. I don't do this at my work, I do this in my free time. And I spend a lot of hours doing it because it's, it's just fun. I'm, I like playing with people. I like playing. You with see how guys. happy he looks if he <laughs> talks about it. So it's it's something that um, that might sound a bit weird and strange in the, in the beginning, but if you start playing around with those guys, and it's actually it's very simple to get started. Um, it's it's a fun topic, and you learn a lot about what is actually relevant, what's actually bad, what's actually out there. How how is Marie actually spreading? How is that? How is how you can understand? You can experience. <laughs> the power of Mireille hitting you. Do you feel it? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.